hospital, okay? Just settling into a league in Durham. Okay, well, good morning to all that have joined us for the Life Sciences Ontario Breakfast event. It's nice to be back in person. As we gather today, we acknowledge the land on which Northeastern University campuses operate. This is the ancestral and traditional territory of many peoples, including the Wandat, Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Seneca, and others whose names and narratives have been erased by time and colonization. This beautiful land and its waters are still home to many diverse peoples and First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples from across Turtle Island. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit. We recognize the role of treaty making in what is now Toronto and accept our collective responsibility for stewardship of the land on which we live and work. As educators, we commit to teaching the students who come through our doors the complex history of the peoples who are imbued in and presently live on this land. So welcome everyone to the campus of Northeastern University Toronto. My name is Monsi Sansel. I'm the Director of Strategic Partnerships, and it is my pleasure to host all of you on our campus. Northeastern was founded in 1898 in Boston, Massachusetts. Today, based on its long-rooted traditions of experiential learning and global impact, Northeastern is a top 50 global research university anchored in one of the world's largest and most innovative cooperative education programs with over 3,000 employer partners worldwide. Northeastern University in Toronto is part of a growing global university system where we have 13 locations across Canada, the US and the UK. Here in Toronto, we offer six graduate programs that are aligned with industry needs and priorities of the province. Our 1300 plus students, some of which have joined us this morning, study in programs at the master's level in project management, regulatory affairs, biotechnology, analytics, informatics, and information systems. All of our programs having a co-op component. And while I've spoken uh, quite a bit about co-op as it's, it's so important to Northeastern, we also recognize the importance of partnership. And Many of our key strategic partnerships are with associations like Life Sciences Ontario. As we continue to grow our network of employer partners, we engage with them in many ways. And they engage with us, such as hiring our talent, being guest speakers, providing company information sessions, and bringing industry problems into our classrooms, to mention a few. I encourage you all to consider Northeastern University Toronto as a partner and it would be my pleasure to connect with you. Once again, welcome to Northeastern University, and I wish you all an informative morning. And now I'd like to call uh, Vanessa to please come forward and introduce our panel for today. I'm sitting in the middle. I'm sitting at the end. All right. <laughs> I'll sit at the end. All right. I can sit at the end. Okay. Yep. There you go. All right. Well, thank you, Monsi. Um, and thank you, uh, Jason, who I don't know if I see here, but also Brian and. Uh... Oh my gosh. <laughs> Sorry, Andy. Andy and the rest of the LSO team for inviting me to uh, to moderate this panel. It's a topic that's kind of near and dear to my heart. Spent some time at a company in, over COVID that grew during COVID and creating culture virtually and with a company who had no stickiness, nothing existed at the beginning was a big deal. Now part of a company that's looking at the what's next and do you do you go back to the way it was and why? and people's reactions and things. So conversations I think that all of us have all of the time and really look forward to doing this. So again, thank you for inviting me and thank you to all of the panelists for being here. Um, I do I have some reminders here. These are written from Brian, I printed your notes. I'm now gonna remind everyone that we're also broadcasting this virtually. So 
Thank you. Welcome everyone who's online. I have no idea how many people are out there, but I'm sure lots. Um, so I need to remind the speakers to please use your microphones, despite the fact that it's a nice intimate room that, um, mm -hmm. that's been set up here for us by Northwestern is we still need to use these so people can hear us on the recording. Um, and also a reminder, the people online, I have an iPad or a Google uh, tablet here uh, that your questions are going to pop up. So if you do have questions, please enter them in the Q&A and we will um, answer them during. Also looking for this to be a little more of a, a dialogue. Um, there are no presentations or there's no slides. So please, if something interest you during it, put your hand up. I'll keep my eyes popping around. We're not holding questions necessarily to the end unless we've kind of got a good, a good riff going up here. So please, we want lots of audience engagement. We think that we're going to learn as much from the people sitting in this room and sitting online. Um, then you're going to learn from just three people or four people up here sitting here talking about your own experience. So with that, um, I'm Vanessa Williamson. I'm the Vice President of Corporate Di uh, Development at SQI Diagnostics and a member of the Life Sciences Ontario Breakfast Committee. Uh, and I'm joined by my three panelists, who I'm not going to introduce because I'm going to let them introduce themselves. So I'm going to start from the left. Hello, everyone. Nice to be here in person at uh, the LSO breakfast meeting. And hello to our uh, people who are online as well. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Anna McGovern, and I am I run a company called MMGI with my partner Kevin McGuire, and some familiar faces out there today. Um, we are a recruitment firm, and what we do is we recruit in the life sciences area. Specifically, we recruit for pharma, uh, medical device, emerging biotech, right across Canada. Uh, we do work with a lot of companies as well in Canada in life sciences that place. Um, place our candidates in the U.S., uh, but generally we're a Canadian recruitment firm. And uh, looking forward to this conversation today because this topic is one that I am very familiar with and probably comes up four or five times a day for me. So I look forward to sharing as well as hearing what my fellow panel members have to say. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Uh, Daryl Wright. I'm a partner at EY. Um, somebody said I should have just taken the Flights across <laughs> from the back here to join everyone, but it's really great to be here. Um, so I lead the future of work and talent practice at EY. Um, you can hear from my accent, I'm not from Canada, although I call Canada home now. I married a Canadian, I uh, grew up in South Africa, so uh, my career took me through um, Unilever, Coke, um, SAB Miller, banking, private equity, and then I joined uh, Scotiabank a couple of years ago as a chief talent officer, and then uh, decided to broaden my reach into the future of work and uh, I now lead the future work practice at, at EY. And I've got lots of stories to tell um, around this whole concept of hybrid work and how organizations have evolved to getting to a point where they're either in it or not, or they're still confused or, or not. Um, so I'm looking forward to this conversation and learning from your own experiences as well. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's nice to see some warm bodies in the same room. It's a little weird. I'm used to being a virtual presence and hi to all the virtual presences out there. I hope we look uh, good to you. Uh, my name is Ken Hughes. I'm the Chief Operating, Operating Officer at Microbics Biosystems based in Mississauga. Uh, normally I say we're about as rare as a uh, hen's teeth for a kind of innovative biotechnology company, but I've got a, somebody next, next to me who does the same sort of thing. Uh, we're a biotech company actually uh, makes things and we sell them. We're profitable and uh, we work in the infectious disease diagnostic space. And uh, we've uh, been very intimately involved in the COVID-19 pandemic response. We produce antigens for uh, diagnostic companies throughout the world. We're an exporter. Uh, we're ISO 1340, uh, 1345 accredited and uh, we're in a very much a growth mode. We're based in Mississauga. We have a, th uh, a, a campus on Watline Avenue in Mississauga. We have 120 staff currently and we're growing and uh, we're growing on from there. We've been involved in uh, infectious disease diagnostics testing, 
We make antigens for uh, serological testing. We make controls to ensure that testing is done correctly. And also, uh, in, uh, we've been supported by the government of Ontario to provide the viral transport medium to allow testing for COVID and other diseases in Ontario. And so far, we've actually provided over 2 million units to the government of Ontario in pandemic response. So we're a little bit uh, different. We're an innovative group and we're continuing to grow. Um, we were an essential business when uh, the pandemic came down. So virtual working has been an interesting uh, subject and I'm looking forward to the discussion today. Anyway, welcome everyone. Great, thanks Ken. And uh, this panel has been put together very deliberately. Um, we just thought it would be a, a very interesting perspective to hear from uh, obviously a company. We know there's lots of different types of companies within this sector, but a company who had to be there during the pandemic, while some people maybe didn't, um, and how that how that worked, and, and how that worked, but also how is it going to work going forward. Um, we obviously have here Daryl um, from the consults, consulting space and people advisory services who's done, along with his team at EY, lots of research, but also lots of conversations yes. with folks. So not just academic for lack of a better word and then of course the recruiter and having a recruiter who speaks to people every day and hears what matters and why and i think one of the things that i heard from um anna earlier was you know what's really important right because i think it's it's so easy to just revert to what we what we think we want but really understanding what the really important pieces are so uh, i think it's going to be a great conversation the only thing i don't know what time does this end? Like, how much time do we have? We, we're, none of us know. Uh, 8.55. 8.55. All right. My watch is actually an old school hands watch, so uh, it'll be approximate. Um, all right, perfect. So I'm going to start with Daryl. Seems like the logical place to start. Daryl, obviously, EY, lots of research into this. And um, our pre-conversation actually influenced the revised title we have, which is back to the office, is it? Is remote working a benefit, a right, or a privilege? And I think that really resonated with me. So really curious a little bit on some of your thoughts around this. What are you seeing? And just kind of hoping that you can set the stage a little bit for us on the topic. Thanks, Vanessa. So what we have seen over the last two and a half years is we've, we've done quite a bit of research and um, surveying in, in the marketplace um, with employers and employees. Um, ranging from employee experiences during the pandemic, how they were addressing it, and um, what they were thinking about in terms of um, what decisions they were going to make coming out of the pandemic. And one of the, um, one of the constants that's come out of, of the research is that flexible working arrangements and hybrid is here to stay. Now, the shape and form of that is certainly going to vary industry to industry, company to company. Um, but we are seeing um, organizations being more deliberate about how they set themselves up for success. Um, and during the course of the conversation this morning, you know, I'll bring in some of that research that we've done. Um, Canadians are on an 8% average, higher average than the global norm, more willing to work remotely. And they believe on a 10% higher average than the global norm that managers and leaders have have, have managed the process really well. So there's a lot of trust in, from an employee's perspective around, well, I can work remotely and comfortably. Um, I always say that remote work was an unnatural, successful experiment, one that hopefully should never be repeated for the reasons why we were all thrust into our basements. And the reason I say that is, I think from a mental wellness perspective, and we've seen a lot of research coming out now, the impact that remote working and the isolation has had on not only individuals, but teams and workplace environments. And for that reason, you know, we do advocate for a, a hybrid model. Um, and in a way, not only from a culture and productivity perspective, but also because humans were never meant to, to work in this level of isolation that we did over the last while. And uh, that's one of the reasons we advocate for some form of return to office, but in a more deliberate and a, and a more orchestrated way. So organizations, are facing resistance um, to the form of coming back to the office. The tonality is changing in the marketplace across different in industries. And, and that being said, I'm also mindful that there are there is a cohort of, of the workforce that's coming, you know, kind of throughout the pandemic. Um, and I don't think enough's been said about those essential workers who, who, are, who have lived through this. 
Um, so it's the knowledge workers, it's the corporate head offices that are, are trying to figure out how to break the habits of people working remotely now and um, how do you create that office experience that's meaningful, that's impactful, that, it, that drives um, a purpose to come back to the office. Um, so we, we, we spend a lot of time with clients trying to figure out what that looks like, when do you come in, why do you come in, what is the, you know, what is the experience like? Um, and one of the surveys we did was we had 24 um, demographic indexes that measured across work-related aspects as well as personal aspects, almost how you could predict which part of your workforce would come into the office, um, willing to come into the office five days a week, which of that portion of the workforce um, based on those demographics would prefer to work um, at home and which one was hybrid. Um, and what we're seeing now is organizations putting out, well, you need to come in the office four days a week or five days a week. We can almost predict where you would be at risk if we just applied those 24 different indexes to say, well, it's going to be the cohort that's at that age group, that demographic, um, that gender, you know, that life stage. You almost want to focus your change activities and efforts there around retention and attraction because we are seeing people and I'm sure you, Anna you see it in your in your industry people are walking when when you say okay we well, got to come back in well you trusted me for two and a half years to be productive the statistics show that productivity actually went up um so yeah there's a there's a lot to be said on this topic yeah no I, I think that's interesting and I'm already going to go off script so um I'm going to switch now because I think um Daryl you kind of slid it right into to Anna maybe you can talk a little bit more about what you're seeing both on the employer, the employee side. Some of the things that are coming to my mind is, you know, is it, is it different ages? Is it different types of roles or, or is there a lot of consistency around, around yeah. the board? And then I'll come back to your question. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, I mean, what, uh, what Daryl was saying really resonated with me because in speaking with so many potential candidates for roles, speaking with so many employers, um, I sometimes feel like uh, the child with, with two parents who are trying to have a conversation and, and seeing that they're actually kind of falling in in the same place in an agreement, but one of them is saying, you know, we've got to get people back in the office and that being corporate and, and the candidates are saying, well, if I have to go in every day of the week, I, I'm not interested, you know, I, 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 I'm not interested, but then there's that happy medium of two or three days a week of hybrid remote that I think the majority of people are pretty pleased about. And the key is flexibility, having that flexibility. And that is the gift that I think companies can give to their employees is that, yes, we, you know, we're going to give you that flexibility. And there's a myriad of reasons as to why people want that flexibility. And it's, you know, there's, there are some financial aspects to it as well. I'm finding with some of the younger candidates that we see, um, I do find that the the uh, more seasoned people who are who have, who have been in the workforce who weren't born into pandemic remote working like some of the Gen Zers um, are are just like yeah two to three days a week that's great. Some of my twenty to thirty somethings though are saying you know I want to be completely remote, and they're actually those that I think might benefit from actually being in the office, being around their peers being around more seasoned workers and seeing how they, they manage. But, uh, but yes, it's fascinating to see that conversation take place. And really, I think it's that flexibility and having that flexibility and then everybody's kind of like in the middle or, or the majority of people are in the middle, um, but, but being open to having that conversation and that nuance around working uh, remotely. I think that's the important thing. So it sounds a lot like I don't know, I heard in there that words matter. If they're, if they're looking for the same thing, you know, coming across that you say you need to be in the office, maybe the assumption by the employee is, you know, a lack of trust. I need to be there five days a week. I do this and you instantly get your backup where you're ultimately kind of looking for the same thing. So I think words like mandates or, you know, required to be and opening the dialogue with that doesn't seem like you're open. I, I think it add to that i think an important thing is is that the whole the whole flexibility thing when i say that companies aren't flexible to remote i sense that candidates are thinking well what else are they not flexible to right so is, is there inflexibility in other areas as well i just wanted to add that no, thanks, sir. 
So go back to your question, which I'm not even going to read anymore. I'm going to say, Ken, what do you have to say about all this? Well, I'll start in, in the, at the more broad level by agreeing with what Daryl and Anna said, because um, and it didn't, it's not germane to what I do, but my wife is an executive in publishing and she's experiencing exactly this, these issues that have just been discussed. I was brought on the panel to because of running a bio, essential biotech company because my problem was a little bit different. So because we, we were designated immediately as everything shut down at the beginning of COVID as an essential service because we were providing reagents and products that were, that were essential to the testing going forward to, and to secure the safety of Canadians and people throughout the world. So our problem was how to keep the staff in the building, manufacturing, testing, developing, releasing, and not have them go down with COVID so we couldn't provide our essential, uh, our essential services throughout the world. And so, and unfortunately, we're a virology company and we're full of virologists, so at least everybody knew what COVID is about and how to manage it. So we, what we did there was we implemented a whole load of policies associated with distancing and masking, and we moved to split shifts. And we got to a point where we said, okay, if you can work at home with your, everybody has a laptop, you know, if you're doing documentation, you can do it digitally. If you don't need to be in the building, don't be in the building. And so people started, we, we went the other way. Those that had to be in, were in making stuff to sell because we're a manufacturing group. And those that could be home were home. And we trusted our staff to do that. And it was, and really, how did we do that? It was really with communication and respect. Like I say, everybody at Microbics is really a virologist or knows a virologist really, really, really well. So they knew what we were doing and they knew why we were doing it. And the consequence of all of that was we never lost a day of production. We never had an intra-company uh, uh, infection uh, because of all the distancing, masking, platooning practices. And, as a, and, and we really continued all the way through. Lots of people got COVID, but, when they went, but we had policies for isolation. We have PCR testing on, on site, so they didn't get back in the building until they PCR test negative as well as all the rapid, rapid tests and things of that nature. But that really worked really well. And I think it, we've gone almost um, by default into a hybrid model where people are now comfortable working at home on documentation, know what they have to do. They've, ge they've generated rapid growth in a biotech company and as a you know, CEO at this company, it's been great to see that and that level of engagement. And I think people are aware at Microbics that their integrity and their abilities are respected and we've moved on from there. Now we've, we've loosened the um, uh, restrictions a little bit uh, because obviously Omicron's everywhere. It's a, it has a, a different demographic, but we still have, have only had one intra company uh, transmission at all, and that was between two senior executives, neither of which was me. <laughs> Good work. <laughs> um, excellent. So thank you. Um, maybe maybe I'll just ask you just to like build on that a little bit because that's what you did during the pandemic. Now that you're now that the pandemic has, we've switched to an endemic, and we that's a topic for another conversation. We won't get into that. Sure. Um, but really, what are your what are you doing now? What does what does life look like now? Are you trying to get back to life before, or is it now? Is it more looking forward and understanding, you know, where where the where the benefits were with productivity, yep. culture, things like that? I think we've got to a nice steady state, and people are aware of um, the, the hybrid model, and uh, you have to have some interactions because you want to be able to synergize in real time. And I know my wife in publishing struggles with that, that kind of, you know, water cooler, or oh, let's fix something in five minutes rather than setting up a Teams call. Because, you know, Teams calls are great, but it's not quite the same. You can't just poke your head in an office, right? You've got to set it up. And that, that has an effect on productivity. Um, going forward, I think we're, we're, doing, we're doing pretty well. Um, we tend to have executives or, or duality in senior positions so people can work at home while the other one's in. So if one goes down, we, we don't lose the entire expertise because, I mean, we do have 120 staff, but we, you know, not everybody does everything. Um, and that's the way it goes from there. So we, I think um, I would say we continue with the hybrid model successfully and we'll continue to do that. People are aware that if, you, you know, if, you, if you're working in a lab and you have sterile cell, cell culture in the lab, you have to be in the lab. Nobody's in, under any illusion about that. And, uh, but in terms of planning, strategizing, and so on and so forth, uh, multiple iterations of how you do that go forward. And I think it's going to be, it's been successful. 
and will continue to be successful. To be perfectly honest, I like going to the office for the very reason I said. I like having those interactions, but with appropriate distancing, appropriate masking, where and you know, not not cramming everybody in the same boardroom at the same time. Uh, I think you can manage it pretty well going forward. And until uh, a variant is much more vicious than the ones that are currently around, then hopefully that won't happen. I think we're in a good place to continue. Thanks, and I, I have to agree. Um, I think we're going to, just so everyone knows, I think we're going to transition sort of the second part of this, acknowledging, yeah, acknowledging that hybrid is hybrid is real and think we're going to get into a little bit around equity and collaboration and building passion and, and um, building culture and things. So that's where we're going to slide to next. So you can hold questions if you have any of those, but I, I will ask if there, if there are any questions. I've got one online that says, and I think probably for Anna, but anyone, you know, does, does maybe yourself, um, Ken, uh, how much does does time, travel time, um, influence people's views of remote work? Like, are you are you hearing that as kind of one of people's concerns? So, so yes, uh, travel time is something that I I do hear about. Um, I think there's a, a few uh, aspects to that, though. I think, and and I mentioned it earlier. I touched upon it. The two topics that come up the most when I'm speaking to a prospective candidate um, is, is the uh, remote aspect as well as money, which wasn't always the case. You know, what's, what's the salary level? Because, you know, everything is, the prices of, of everything is, is go are going up right now. Inflation, there's, you know, interest rates and, um, you know, the price of gas. So I'm, it's not just the time and, oh, I've got to get into the office and I, I, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to be in the office. It, it's, it's also, there's a financial component to it. So uh, I think that factors in as well. I hope right. that answers those And I see everyone, I've got three hands, so I keep looking and smiling, which means I'm coming back to you, but I, I'm going to go to uh, Daryl Smile first. Yeah, so, um, and I, spot on. I mean, one of the areas, uh, commute time is a massive um, driver around, even at our offices, we're a office-based culture that embraces flexibility. They would like us to be in the office three to four days a week, um, we're averaging about two um, at partner level. Um, so commute time is one of those 24 indexes, um, demographic indexes that we measure. And, it's, it, and with COVID, a lot of people moved out of the cities. So to try and get people back in has been, uh, has been a big challenge. And, and the commuting is an issue. I personally yesterday got really frustrated we all had our own lived experiences and, and stories about COVID coming into the office. Trains are shortened. There's no express um, services. And we were jam-packed like sardines into that train. I thought, not only is there a customer service challenge I'm having here, but there's a health thing that I'm really kind of, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with this. So commute time is, 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 is a big challenge around uh, why employees are battling to get their um, employees, employers are battling to get employees back into the office. Yeah, for sure. I, I took the TTC to get to an event yesterday and I took it home at, at 6.15 p.m. And yeah, even if I was masked, which I wasn't because I didn't think about it, um, it was, yeah, it, it didn't feel good. So again, I seem to have the reverse problem here. Um, Microbics is in Mississauga and so I and, I and others commute against traffic. So the actual drive is easy. It's lovely, but it is a drive. So people coming to microbics expect to work in a the lab. They're generally scientists and technicians and, and related uh, related um, jobs. And so they expect to be in the lab. And when they're here, they don't have to come in every day. They actually see that it's a benefit. And so, you know, we are going, we are going against traffic. It's easy to get to. If it's appropriate, you can work at home so you don't have the problem with the gas, to Anna's point, and you don't have to sit on the uh, gardener in your car going mad for an hour. Because I drive the other way on the garden and I see the lineup coming in thinking, I'm so glad I'm going to miss the saga. <laughs> yeah, no, it make, makes complete sense. So I've got three questions here. Oh, you're number four, three. And we might, we might just, I might take a couple and then keep moving so we have some more discussion. Are we, am I, do I have to repeat them? Do we have a microphone? Go ahead. Yeah, so like Anna said, uh, people from Gen Z, the 20s and 30s generation, they started working during the time of winter. So most of us, I think, are conditioned to work from home. We have yeah. just created this comfort space around us. But somehow is like, I think, disturbing the mental space of people because isolation does affect you. Working from home in isolation does affect you. So don't you think that companies should 
encourage some kind of interaction and some events or something once a week or something for these people who are you know working remotely from home so maybe model as such for now. Yeah, so maybe just for the folks online, I'll try to uh, repeat that really briefly. For the folks who've just entered, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, just entered the workforce during the pandemic, they're used to working at home. Um, so there's kind of maybe a little bit of that expectation, yet they are isolated, um, maybe just personally, but also from the rest of the company. And the question is, do you think there should be an opportunity or, or should companies, you know, create these opportunities for collisions and creating culture. So thank you for sliding us to the next part of the conversation. I'm going to jump in and say we were, Daryl and I were talking about this in a company I was at previously. We were, before COVID, we were disparate locations and one of our offices was in Markham. And I, you know, the team only got together previously in, uh, moments of crisis or response to something that had to be done. And one of the things I did was institute a Markham Mondays where everyone had to be there just because it was Monday. And people complained at first, but then they realized they talked, they built that culture, they worked together, and that turned into a really productive team. And, you know, we weren't buying them snacks or lunch or drinks or anything. It was just creating that sort of fun environment. So I think the office experience was one word that Daryl used that really resonated. You talk about Anchor Tuesdays, so maybe you can just add a little bit more because I think that's I think that's critical to building this culture and passion and and stickiness. So I, I think that's a great question, and I think many companies are wrestling with that. And you know, we we've seen an explosion of listening tools and uh, and employee engagement surveys and and one of the key aspects that's come out of this is how do we how do we create that experience that positive experience in the office um and for the first time we've now got two experiments we've had pre-covid office-based work and we've got remote based and now people are trying to figure out what does this hybrid thing look like so being deliberate and i think that's where organizations need to architect and design and really spend time thinking about that office experience. So we, 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 in the pandemic, we saw a lot of people saying, well, we want to shrink our leasing footprint. And we yeah. actually have seen the reverse in some instances where some organizations bought um, and leased, you know, more floors of, of office space and created um, um, collaboration rooms and flipped the um, office layout from being, you know, 30% collabor um, collaboration and 70% um, hot desking to the reverse of that. So we've, we've instituted in our team, and, and I think what works in organizations is to have a guiding set of principles at the top of the house and let your teams create what we call kind of your, your North Star charter yes. team. And our team decided we want Anchor Tuesdays. We come in on Tuesdays, we have all our team meetings, we have a social, and we, we are very deliberate about creating that experience. And we've got a workforce where the average age is 27. We're a knowledge workforce. We're, we were run off the apprenticeship model. And we, we do think it's important. And just, just, just the mental wellness and health challenge behind it and the science tells you you need that engagement. We need that connectivity. But organizations need to be deliberate about setting themselves up for success in that space. I love that. I think deliberate is the word that that kicked in there rather than just saying be there, you know, flexible, but have some have the that opportunity, but have deliberate. I can feel that Ken wants to say something. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a really great question. And it speaks to the new reality and the real the challenge that is provided, an additional challenge to management and to staff to communicate properly in a situation where you're not together all the time. And to your point, it would be really easy to dodge that and silo yourself and hide. But, it, but it's, that's a two-way street in the, the competence you have to develop in being a manager and a worker and in, in, in building your career. And so people are, are developing new tools. I love the, you know, getting together once a week. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about my wife again. Sorry, Nicole. But half of her staff's in New York. And so she used to jump on a plane every so often to meet with them, but obviously couldn't do that for the last couple of years. So they have developed these types of mechanisms to synergize as best they possibly could and communicate appropriately but that's the description of how management has evolved so people can build that relationship virtually and then do it personally when they can uh, I, I i think many some people do it well some people don't do it well 
but it is an issue and an issue we have to be mindful of if we're going to build successful growing businesses. There are efficiencies that come with this new model. There are dangers that come with this new model. You've got to have your eyes open to both. Great question. No, I, think, uh, I think both uh, Daryl and Kim handled that really well coming from like a company perspective and the research that you've done. The only thing I, I could add maybe is, is that um, I, uh, I know that working with a big pharma in Montreal, Novartis, they, he, it was a very public article that they put out about their WeWork uh, um, program that they have where, where they've abandoned their cubicles and they have like this amazing office, like in the center of Montreal, right near where, near where the Montreal Canadians play. If you're from Montreal, that's very important to have that kind of energy around and glass you know, windows everywhere. So you can see the city and feel the energy of it and, and a kind of like a similar uh, comfortable situation like we have here where you've got comfortable chairs to sit in very collaborative environment. And uh, I've spoken to a few uh, of the employees there and they've said that it's worked amazingly well. So, you know, just creating a new environment. Why go from your cubicle at home to a cubicle at work, right? <laughs> Um, okay, so these, this is actually going right into where, where our follow-up questions were. So thank you. That really started out a good discussion for that one. I'll, I think, looking for ideas to create these, these the word deliberate is important and, and figuring out what are those deliberate opportunities when you're there rather than just having, I don't think flexibility necessarily means just openness and, and complete flexibility. Um, Allison, you had a question. Well, I did, and maybe you've answered some of this, but Maybe it's on. Okay. Uh, maybe you've answered some of this, but um, it sounds to me like you all assume that there should be some time in work, but many companies have the opportunity through the pandemic to go global and hire somebody anywhere. And actually, maybe this is going to switch into the equity piece. So I apologize if I'm, I'm, you know, there's an just one step ahead of us, Allison. No, there's been opportunities for people to get very high quality jobs, but not have to come into the office. So it's more, I guess my question is maybe to Anna, especially to see in, in this, uh, well, it's not lab based. Have you seen more of a switch for companies saying, well, now we can hire anybody from anywhere. Um, because they can all work. And then how do you manage that? Because if it's a small, if it's a big company, you can buy people anywhere. If it's a small company, that's not going to happen. Um, and certainly for one other thing, well, certainly for some of the um, uh, data generated uh, life science companies, if they insist people come to work, they lose them. Google's coming in, Amazon's coming in. They don't have to go into the office. And so how do you manage that as an employer? So I think, yeah, um, we'll let Anna certainly grab that. Equity was our, our third. No, no, it's great. Equity is our third bullet. And exactly what you were saying, Allison, here, and we, we do want to talk into tapping into people that have been hired remotely. And it doesn't even have to be global. It could be someone from Ottawa if you're in Toronto, someone from Montreal if you're in Ottawa, someone who honestly can't get into their car and just get there daily. And how do you how do you create that culture? How do you create that stickiness? How do you create that that equity or that lack of resentment? I was speaking to someone last week that was just talking. Um, they said, you know, they have someone who works reception and of course they need to be there. But, you know, that that might be one of the lower paid jobs and then they get a whole bunch of things. So, yeah, let's talk equity. I don't know if I can address the question of equity, but I, I, I think that some of the issues that I see around that is at the minute, it really is a candidate market out there. So companies that are really flexible to completely remote, they do have more flexibility in terms of they're getting a, a larger pool of candidates to choose from. So instead of like, for instance, I just did a search where um, I was working with a company that was out West and kind of a remote area. And they wanted to have somebody and they were willing to relocate them, bring them into the office. And they, they were, you know, let's fly them in for interviewing and everything else. And let's get them situated here um, for a project manager manufacturing role. And I started doing the search and I cast the net wide because you need to do that these days. You need to contact a lot of candidates because a lot of them are going to be like, no, thank you. And um, spoke to a lot of people. 
And there were a lot of people doing manufacturing project manager jobs remotely, completely remotely, living up on a ski hill in, you know, uh, in BC and doing that job. So I had a lot of no's around that. So I think having that flexibility to, uh, to completely remote for some companies, CROs do this extremely well, you know, and they're, they're, and they've been very successful at it. And we've been working with a, a completely virtual company that, you know, hiring is, is, is challenging because you want to hire people who are accountable, responsible, can work independently. They have to really drill down on the hiring aspect, but the virtual can work and productivity can go up. Um, the one thing I'm seeing, the complaint that I get from candidates who are working in this sort of like, oh yeah, I can work from anywhere, is they're dealing with time zone issues. They're having meetings with people in, you know, across the globe and at two in the morning, and that's not okay. And then they're calling me and saying, I'm looking for another job. I'm making a ton of money but I can't do this anymore. It's not sustainable. So I think that's one of the things we're looking at. I'm going to weigh in on, on the topic of talent and the access to global talent, because it is a reality that the, the talent scope has just increased globally, but there are some practicalities around setting yourself up for success in this space and all as an organization, Bes besides the reality of time zones, there are real immigration tax issues, which organizations need to be comfortable with. Um, we've just rolled out a program with one of the Canadian banks where they are leveraging this remote working as a competitive advantage. And we've set up three technology hubs in the US to access talent. And we researched the density and availability of talent across a number of metrics in the different cities. We looked at 52 cities in, in North America. We honed in on three and we've now just recently set up these technology hubs from kind of soup to nuts. Um, to be able to then access talent that will then service a Canadian-based company that's that's growing. So, and they were comfortable with the tax implications. They they very clear on on using that and leveraging it. Um, but they, there's just the known knowns. You've got to be aware of those implications and comfortable with it. And then and then you can set yourself up for success. Shopify, for example, went went very global and public on their digital first um, strategy. And they were setting up, and I think last year they wanted to hire 2,300 odd um, engineers. And they were going to hire them regardless of where they were based. And if they were based in a country where they had no representation, they, they were setting up what they called it in a legal term, the global organization, which then takes care of working from anywhere. So there's just some known kind of constraints that you have to work with. And then we are seeing people access talents, um, not only regionally, but cross, cross border. I actually have a question for my fellow panelists on this one. It's not, it's not really germane to what I do, but it's what I've heard, and maybe I've heard wrong, but you, you can correct me. So I've heard that in, in there are a lot of US law firms that are hiring Canadian-based lawyers and paying them US um, wages to live in their relatively inexpensive Canadian realities such that Canadian firms can't hire them. And there's a de deficit for Canadian firms of lawyers because they're all working for American firms. Is that true? And is that a real issue? I have not heard that. But <laughs> yeah, we have heard that. To my previous point, you know, organisations that are making um, that, that that are aware of the constraints of cross-border hires are setting themselves up and accessing talent accordingly. And it goes back to the initial thing, you know, benefit, privilege, or rights. And organizations are, are kind of, I mean, we're working with one of the other banks right now where we're re-looking their remote working policy because they want, you know, people are saying, well, I, I, I live in, I've got a, my home country is Mexico. I wouldn't mind adding on two to three weeks on my holiday and working from there. And there needs to be some form of consistency and policy in place. Um, so organizations are thinking about how they can access talent and scarce talent. So in the tech space, that's a reality. In these top, in, 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 and, and where there are scarce skills, uh, organizations are doing exactly as you said. Yeah, it makes intuitive sense that that would be a problem in, in the scarcity of talent world that, you know, and with globalization and work from home, you pull them from anywhere. And so that leaves a deficit for where they are. And that's a, a, definitely a challenge for, um, how can I put this, lighter economies. And I think then it, it comes into the whole stickiness of and maintaining those folks within your organization and turnover and building that culture and integration. And I think Allison in our in our breakfast committee call earlier had spoken about, you know, 
big pharma and lots of other companies have done this forever because they are disparate. They're across the world. And I think there's pl things we can learn. This seems to be a time to really sit back and not just revert to the old, but look to some of those, some of those models and lots of um, opportunities. Did you still have the same question? All right. Slide it up. Is it? Yeah. Cool. So, um, you know, I, I don't think that we have, uh, or I hope we are not in a disagreement that the hybrid mode is, is here to stay, right? But I think it's even the resistance to bring people back two to three days. And um, you feel people, they, they are now feeling that they were more productive at home. When they go to the office now, time is taken for the socialization, which I think is good. But people started to see that this is, you don't know if it's a resistance or it's reason to stay at home, but, but probably we, we, we started to lose this human touch, right? With people working remotely, and then it's now becoming hindered to be productive. So I go to the office, I will probably, you know, kill like 25% of what I'm doing at home because I'm forced to speak to people. <laughs> <laughs> but that's true, right? So, and, 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 and here, even the two to three days are becoming a challenge to achieve. So have, we have been talking about the office experience, but I'm, I'm actually even more curious how to bring people back to the office, how to bring the hybrid mode. So it's not now, is it hybrid or not, but how to initialize the hybrid. I think it's important to, to share some ideas or some tactics. Huh? I'm gonna, Ken mentioned something that was really important around how they were successful during the pandemic and that's communication. And, um, one of the big banks put out a statement a couple of weeks ago to say we, we're moving to a four-day in the office mandatory. And we, we have seen the tonality of a change. There's two big research points which organizations are, are focusing on, and that's trust and employee experience. And we've also researched where there were disconnects between employers and employees. The issue of culture and productivity were the two areas where there was a big difference and, and corporate travel. Um, just as a throw out there, employees want to return to pre-COVID travel because they join organizations with travel being one of the benefits and um, employers are saying, no, you can do that on a Zoom call because they'd be putting that saving to the bottom line. But on the, on the productivity, employees feel that they're um, more productive uh, than they were, uh, than what the employers think. And on the culture side, um, em employees feel that culture has improved um, with, with hybrid and remote working. Um, but there is that, that, that mentality that still sits within maybe your more senior tenured um, em employers that want to get the employees back into the office. And it's a control thing. And that's why I go back to the trust thing. You've trusted the employees to work remotely in very harsh conditions. On what basis? you know, do you, do you mandate them to come back into the office if you're not going to focus on the experience that they have when they're in the office? Uh, that is exactly right. It's uh, your basic, I mean, it's a tipping point here, right? Either extreme is going to lead to, to deficiencies. The hybrid model is here. We talked about um, communication and respect and articulating the value proposition properly. Interacting in real time is going to lead to synergies. You cannot do that on teams in a, in a maximally effective way. So of course, you, you, know, you respect people that can work at home, they're productive in that environment. You bring them in for a certain uh, proportion of time for that synergy and you have to articulate with respect and get their buy-in as to the synergy associated with that. That is, speaks to the, the, the new challenge, if you like, to a good manager and, and a good manager, of course, respects all the staff, all their staff, their reports and their reports, reports and communicates with them properly. So they understand the value of, what, of their individual position, what they're doing and how they can maximize that value. Because of course that leads to bonuses and promotions and everything else. So again, it's about communication. It's about managing on, 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 that, on, that, on that middle ground, like everything else, extreme one side or the other is bad. And then you have to articulate that value property and that's what good managers do. I'm going to add in there. I think one of the other things that you're seeing that I'm seeing or talking to people and hearing about is 
during, and it's kind of aligns with what you're with what you're suggesting is people have given up some space during the COVID or their company, their companies have grown and they're bringing people back, but they don't actually have a really good work environment, like a physical environment. Forget about like, well, I guess that's part of office experience, but just even a physically good place to work that's productive, which I think also really influences. I mean, I love the office experience. I love the anchor Tuesdays. I love the deliberate piece. I think in terms of what I've heard from your, uh, you know, to answer your question is doing that and creating those times that when people are there, that there's really some structured value that they should be getting out of it. It's not just those informal collisions and water coolers and that sort of, we can agree to disagree on the wasted time with people or, but also have to respect diversity of people. Some people, for some people that's energizing and makes them more productive for others. It's, it's a time waster. And I think you know, maybe one of the things we really have to think about too is just really the diversity and what that means in our workforce, uh, diversity of people and, and environments. And, and Anna wants to say something and I'll let Daryl say something. You no, know, I, I think it's got to make sense. I think that a lot of uh, employers from what I'm hearing felt that they really lost something when their, you know, employees were working from home and they weren't in the office. But did they really lose something? And if if you look at productivity, look at the bottom line, look at employee satisfaction, and and you know, see, uh, look at the metrics and see if if they did in fact lose something. And now, candidates getting back into the office, I'm finding you know they feel like they're losing something. We had this this trust and this ability to work from home and flexibility, and we're going to lose something. So it's just like reflecting on that and really understanding. Have, have we really lost something and, and can we work with everybody's different needs, just as, as you said, Vanessa? Uh, you mentioned the word metrics and I think back to the equity conversation, uh, employers are really worried about this equity challenge. Um, and from a talent perspective, uh, we've, we've, we, with one, one client, we put in a series of, of metrics and, a, and a, a, a data strategy to say, well, let's, let's categorize people into three work modes um, you know, remote, um, or office bound and, uh, and hybrid. And then we tracked on a number of metrics from a DE and I, from a performance, from career progression, from promotions to see whether there was any bias that was built into this hybrid model so that you could then with the data, make those informed decisions, you know, so, um, that people didn't feel disadvantaged because of their personal circumstance that they had to be remote or by virtue of the type of work they do, they were designated remote and were they being disadvantaged or advantaged. And I think causality was a key thing to be able to stress test how organizations were then tracking that data. And I think that's probably where the um, organizations have done really well. And HR teams is really kind of uh, engaging employees and listening to what employees um, are, are doing. And I think probably for, for, for me, the, the biggest question I ask is try and meet the employees where they're at and where they're at is different for different people. So we've kind of seen a lot of people create personas and cluster them into kind of personas. And then you've got to manage and create benefits and policies for those clustering of, of personas to try and, to try and kind of, you know, kind of meet everyone almost halfway. Um, but then, you know, it, it starts with setting up your, 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 your guardrails and your principles up front to say, you know, you're either an office space culture that embraces flexibility and then everything around that then needs to be able to talk to that. And then you've got to listen, learn and iterate and course correct as you go through the, these cycles, because we're seeing now what was true six months ago has been outdated today and you've got to then pivot and respond to those, those, those issues. All right. I'm not getting the big signal yet, but I know he wants to do it because I'm four minutes late because he also gave me a digital clock. So I'm going to close this out. I apologize. I see a few hands sneak up, but I know we, don't need, we do need to wrap it up. So Anna, Daryl, um, sorry about that. Ken, uh, <laughs> I did not forget your name. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you everyone in the audience and folks remotely as well for joining us. Thank you for the good discussion. It kind of went right where we were supposed to, where we wanted to go. I, uh, I see lots of snacks, sorry, no virtual snacks, but people online here. Um, so I'm sure the panelists will be here to have um, time to discuss for a little bit after. And I wanna just uh, welcome, I guess, Alison Symington from our breakfast committee up to close this off. Thank you, everybody. I'm just gonna let Brian, yep, start.
on the screen. Um, so I just have a few closing housekeeping. First of all, I want to thank you all coming. It's the first time in more than two years, I think, that we've all been in one space or around two years. Um, and from someone who works at home for the last eight years, so I am a remote worker permanently, um, it's nice take advantage of some networking opportunities. So I appreciate that. I was telling someone else, I'm in Halifax this afternoon. <laughs> so, sometimes I do Vancouver, Edmonton, Halifax in one day, which I also, I've never done in one day when I was actually traveling, but I did in two days. So actually doing it virtually as well. Um, so there's a couple of things that I just want to do. Housekeeping one is that we have a survey. You can scan the QR code on the screen um, if you want to, or um, I believe it's also on the website. So you can go and uh, do a survey. We always want to hear from you about what we're doing and how we can serve you better. So please do that. The other thing I wanted to mention is we have our award nominations. These award nominations come from members. And then a committee gets together to look at those. So if we don't get award nominations at a Tabacala Gala or an event where we have no awards. Um, so we've made it really easy this year. So if you are here, you can fill out this. Um, and with your name, your email, just names here, we'll get back in contact with you if we need to, to get more information. So please do fill it out. Or you can actually um, go online and do it as well. So it's really easy. I think our deadline is November 2nd, but actually you could do it today. So before you leave, everybody fill out one. As someone who sits on the committee, I'd really appreciate it. A couple other things to talk about are Ideas to Action Life Sciences Forum. Uh, we've done a lot of work in the last few years to really move on our policy forum. We're moving policy to action. This is a call to action. Again, we need you guys to be there, everybody to be there. Um, to be able to um, to move life sciences to uh, to action in this province, um, and there's all the speakers, and you can go online and find out more information about that. Uh, upcoming, we have uh, another breakfast series. This is going to be on cybersecurity on wow. November 17th. So please join us for that. I believe we'll be in person again. Um, wow. And honestly, the food breakfast excellent. So. I'm sure it's lovely wherever you're sitting online, but maybe not quite the same. Somebody made it for us, so that's the big difference. Um, and then December 15th is always a great time. It's a member marathon. Well, you, some of our new members get up and chat, and we can have networking there as well. So finally, I always want to say we are member-driven, so we thank all of our corporate sponsors. So here's some of the platinum sponsors. I'm not going to read them out, uh, but you can see them. Our gold sponsors our silver sponsors. I want to specifically thank um, Northeastern University today for hosting us. What a fabulous space. So check out, see what they're up to. Um, I think that's really interesting. And finally, I want to thank all the members. As I say, we're a member-driven organization. If you have ideas for the breakfast committee, you can let us know. You can either contact the office or find some of us online. Uh, we're always happy to hear what, what you're interested in. And as I say, if you have a question, you want to know about life sciences in Ontario, you want to help get help from Life Science Ontario, you want to know how you can partner with us, you can talk to Andy at the back there. Um, and we're always happy to hear from you. So have a great rest of day. Um, for those of you here, please take advantage of the opportunity to have some breakfast and chat with everybody. And for those of you online, we're going to see you again soon. All right. Thank you, everybody. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>